Amen. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is what he was known as in many cases. And uh, these old time, Old Testament prophets, man, major prophets and minor prophets, uh, they're not just to be swept under the rug or forgotten about. They uh, have many important things that, uh, that relate to us uh, as, as it were, as they spoke to uh, Israel themselves and to, to uh, the, the, the people of Israel, God's people. Um, it matters, the whole Bible. You know, I, I, don't think if, uh, I don't think God would have given us the 39 of the Old Testament if it didn't have a reason. You know, there's a reason for it. Oh, there's all kinds of reasons, practical and uh, uh, reasons, but historical reasons. Uh, we get the whole picture, you know, uh, how it all came to be. And um, uh, I started again uh, in Genesis, and I like I started off the year um, just doing studies and, and reading, not really with the aim of reading completely through, but uh, I like the um, I like to be intentional. I went back to Genesis this morning and. Uh, started at Genesis 1, and uh, uh, the Old Testament matters. It matters. I know I would preach a lot out of the New Testament. Um, I feel that's where we are parked. But um, the Old Testament, like I said, has very has a whole lot to say. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll hop right into this. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Uh, I believe everybody in here, if we would be monogamist, we would say we're I, and I hope they would. I, I, I hope this is their desire, but we would want to say we as a church are hungry and we're thirsty. Uh, we want blessings and we want to uh, be blessable. Uh, it's not just staying, standing before your throne with our hand out saying, God, give me, give me, give me. Lord, we as a church, I think we look ourselves in the mirror quite often and we say, um, Lord, have we done things right? We're a soul-winning church. We preach the Bible. We, we, we try to preach the Great Commission and love one another and be the right kind of church, a biblical kind of church, and um, not use the Laodicean age as an excuse to be lazy, uh, but to be awake, to, be, uh, to notice what's going on in the world around us and then to, to stay on top of things. Lord, we want to be um, a blessable church, blessable families and Blessable individuals. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us to, to confess our sins, forsake our sins, start living purely, uh, putting off the, the things of the old nature and the old man, and to start obeying the Bible. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah 5, Jeremiah 5, verse 25 verse 25. It's been a minute since I've done this. Just read one verse and, and, and uh, hop right into a message. Lately, I've been reading six, seven, eight, ten verses. I won't do that tonight. Uh, I want to read one verse. The Bible says in Jeremiah 5, 25, your iniquities have turned away these things, these blessings, and your sins have withholden good things from you. Pretty straightforward, right? Let me read that one more time. Your iniquities, and by, uh, by the way, iniquities just means lawlessness or um, uh, egregious violations of law. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. Now, um, there's many things to say about sin. You can say all kinds of things about sin. Sin is bad. Sin separates. You know, sin... Um, uh, deceives, uh, sin, sin, sin sends people to hell, the sin of unrepentance. You know, sin is bad. You know, we could say all kinds of things. But one thing that I don't know if we ever really recognize is sin is a thief. Sin is a thief. Sin is a robber. Um, and what sin does is it robs man of everything that God values or puts a stamp on as precious and valuable. You see, sin robs us of things. Now, um, thank God, though, it doesn't rob us of our, uh, once you're saved, it doesn't rob you of your salvation. The sin question, though, has been solved through Jesus Christ. Of course, that's uh, Jesus Christ died for our sins. 
according to scriptures uh, that uh, was prophesied that he would. He was buried and rose again on the third day, according and prophesied as he would in the scriptures. So if a man believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not going to suffer eternity in hell. The, he won't suffer the penalty of sin. He won't suffer the second death in the lake of fire. He says, or he has, according to the Bible, a home in heaven, and his eternal destination is in settled, or is settled, and everybody can praise God for that. Every person can can deep, a deep, a, 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 take a big uh, sigh of relief on that and just go, Whew. you don't have to hold your breath. You don't have to second guess. You don't have to cross your fingers and go, well, I trusted the Lord, but just in case. No, you trusted the Lord. It's settled. It's settled. Now, um, uh, sin cannot steal your um, relationship to the Lord. Sin cannot steal, steal your relationship. Houston, come here. Lucas, come here. Use both of you. All right, one of you over here, you're wearing red, so you stay on my left. You come over here, you're on my right. All right, so you're the bad son today, okay? You're the good son today. And you know why they're laughing and smiling about that? Because he's really the good son and he's the best. <laughs> Get over here, boy. Don't disobey your... No, they're both good sons. Okay, so I have two sons. The relationship is father-sons. Father-sons. Okay, we got that. Sin comes along. Let's say his sin is disobedience. Sin does not change the relationship. It changes the fellowship. Obedience brings closer. Obedience brings kinship, fellowship, um, um, oneness, and unity. When uh, Can two walk together lest they be agreed? You know the only way the disobedient son gets back to the father? One of two, uh, uh, there's two, th two steps. One is coming to dad and saying, dad, I've done wrong. Say that, dad, I've done wrong. Dad, I've done wrong. Dad, I've done wrong and I'm sorry. Dad, I've done wrong and I'm sorry. I'm ready to obey. Okay, we all do that. Lord, I'm sorry. I, I've done wrong. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm ready to obey. Okay, the next step is obedience. So when dad says, when the father says, okay, here's the next command coming from your father. I want you to go help your mother or I want you to go help your brother in the field. And you say, I go and go not. Okay, you may have sincerely been sorry, but obedience is the next step to nearness to God and faith fellowship with God. Sin cannot steal your sonship, but it will steal your fellowship. You see, he's a good son. Man, I want to please my dad. I love my dad, and I want a good fellowship with my dad, and, and I, I, I want that with him. Why can't I? You see, it is no longer he that is doing it. It is sin that dwelleth in him. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Now understand that when Paul said, Man, I find a war inside of me. He said, the good that I would, I do not. And the evil that I would not, that I do. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's sin dwelling in him that's separating him from his father. It's the same with us. Same thing with the son who would obey. It's the obedience that has gotten control. It's the new man that has gotten control over the old man that brings nearness to the father. Okay, you frauds can go sit down now. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Okay, so it can't steal your sonship. It steals your fellowship. You know, when you've been living in sin, it's a whole lot more difficult to go to your prayer closet. Man, when you've been living in sin, it's, it's um, and, and doing it unre with unrepentance, unrepentantly. It's difficult to go to the Lord or even, even conviction. Man, the devil will beat you down. You've been living in sin. You did something, the you did something bad. The devil will be like, see, you're, you're bad. You, don't you can't go talk to the Father. The Lord doesn't want to hear from you. You just committed that sin. God doesn't want to hear you. You better wait till tomorrow. See, sin is a robber and it cannot steal, though, your sonship and it cannot steal your salvation. Sin cannot steal your salvation. Now, I want to warn you, um, about this thief tonight, sin. I want to warn you about him. I don't like getting robbed. I don't like having people steal from me. 
I don't like my stuff coming up missing, and neither do you. When I put something in its dedicated place, I want to know without a shadow of a doubt that that's where it's going to be until the day I die, until, unless I move it. No one has a right to take any of my stuff. No one has a right. I don't like a thief. You don't like a thief. But we are so deceived and so blinded in many times and so unaware most times that we don't recognize what sin is doing to us. The Bible says um, that we're supposed to be like watchmen on a tower, not only looking for the coming of Christ, but on the lookout for the enemy. In many mountain areas where the, where the climate gets dry, they have um, ranger stations in the middle of the wilderness that are fire lookouts. It's his job to look out on the horizon to look for smoke. So he can call it in and say, hey, we've got wildfire over and this is the area. And they can come and start taking care of it. He is a watchman in the tower looking out for smoke, looking out for where fire is. So uh, uh, we've got to be on the lookout for, uh, for sin. We've got to be look out on the lookout for sin. I'm already, on the, uh, I'm already aware of my flesh. And I already am aware of the devil, that old lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. But the other enemy is sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is um, uh, just uh, saturated in sin. And that's where we find most of it. The world produces most of our amusement, uh, uh, amusement sins and uh, uh, things that distract us from what's important. But we can't lose our sonship. We can't lose our salvation. So you, Christian, me, excuse me, uh, we as Christians, um, we don't need, we should not need, excuse me, we should not allow sin into our home. We should not allow it into our heart and allow it into our life. Sin will take good things from you. The Bible says it right here, sin. Oh, and your sins have withholding good things from you. Some of us wonder tonight, why am I not getting these good things from the Lord? Uh, sins, your sins are withholding them. Your sins are withholding them. So uh, uh, I want to point out point number one tonight. Point number one tonight, sin. what does sin steal? What does sin steal? It steals a good conscience. A good conscience. I didn't say a clear conscience. I said a good conscience. You say, <coughs> uh, I've heard interviews with people before who were in prison for doing heinous crimes. And the interviewer asked them, and it seemed like their conscience was, was clear. They can say they had a clear conscience. How is that? Because their conscience was cleared because it was seared. They had a clear conscience. Sure they did. I've got a clear conscience about the sins that I commit because, son, you okay? Okay. Because he had a seared or severed conscience. The airwaves of morality aren't getting through anymore because it's a severed conscience. The Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 9, and they which heard it being convicted of the, by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. They were convicted by their own conscience. Even though they had rocks in their hands, get that, they had rocks in their hands when they heard the truth, they had a good conscience about it. Their conscience convicted them. Isn't that a neat thing? Here you are doing something, and, ah, and you're, oh, you, you hear truth or a rebuke, and your conscience gets a hold of you and says, you know that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. You see, when we live in sin, Sin will steal a good conscience. You can steal from your parents or from loved ones or from friends and not have a guilty conscience about it and say, why? Why is that guy so maliciously, he's so calculated and cold in his sin? Why? Because his conscience isn't convicted anymore because sin has stolen or has uh, uh, robbed him of his good conscience. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, uh, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned, a good conscience. You see, we can't have charity and we can't drop the rock if our conscience is not good. You'll be the one throwing the rock. You and I will throw the rocks. You and I will, will not have charity out of a pure heart because we can't have a good conscience. It said uh, charity out of a good heart and of a good conscience. That sounds like two uh, uh, and, uh, and a faith unfeigned. That's three ingredients. 
First Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Why are people doing the things that they're doing with a clear conscience? Because it's a seared conscience. They don't have a good conscience. Just because somebody is um, confident or um, uh, unswayed in their decisions, even though sinful, and you say, man, how, how are they living that way? Oh, because they have a clear conscience. When somebody says they have a clear conscience, you need to get that clarified. Clear or good? The Bible doesn't say, hey, have a clear conscience. It says have a good conscience. Have a good conscience. So sin steals a good conscience, and sin removes your purity of thought and heart. When you have sin in, you will get sin out, the product of sin. Purity of thought and heart. No purity of thought and heart anymore when sin moves in. Perception about right and wrong. What is right and wrong? What is right and wrong? Truth. The landmarks, the ancient landmarks of truth have been moved in our country by yards. Hey, 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 listen up. Perception about right and, wrong, right and wrong. What's right? What's wrong? Who knows anymore? People with a good conscience. People with a good conscience. And the people that have a good conscience are the ones who are always offending the ones who have a clear conscience. Oh, I sure, I can be in love. You, that that, that uh, 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 36-year-old man, that 38-year-old man, that 45-year-old man, he can feel sincere that he loves that 9-year-old girl and have a clear conscience about it. Well, that's just society tells me that I can't love them. Oh, we think we're not, we're not going there? Oh, we're not there yet, Brother Jake. That's pedophile. You know, that, we're not there yet. Oh, we're moving there. We're moving there. People marrying their horses, loving their dogs. And I don't mean loving the dog and petting him and feeding him and taking care of him and, you know, man's best friend. But I mean... Loving their dogs. You say, what? Yeah, I'm talking, yeah, the Bible talks about it. Wickedness, vileness, unnatural affections. Oh, 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 that will never go that way. Sure it is. People put it in their signs or the signs in their yards all the time. Love is love. Love is love. Love is love. When I was a kid, they were still like not, I mean, it was still like stay in the closet. And if you come out of the closet, you know, it was still real low key. It wasn't drag queens and strippers at library time in front of kids like it is now. Sin robs, and they have a clear conscience about it. They are doing it flamboyantly, glamorously, extravagantly. Why? Because of a clear conscience. A clear conscience doesn't mean it's a good conscience. A good conscience knows right and wrong a good conscience can say, this is, this is what God has to say about it. If you want to know what, somebody, what kind of conscience somebody has, find out what biblical principle they're standing on. If they have a biblical principle to stand on, you can almost, and I wouldn't bet, but you could almost take it to the bank that they have a, a, biblical, a biblical principle is a good conscience. If they do not have a biblical principle, it's probably not a good conscience. Number one, sin steals a good conscience. Sin steals a good conscience. Number two, sin steals your calmness. I believe in anxiety. I believe in that. I believe that sometimes your chemistry in your body can be off. Um, you know, I, I believe all that. But I'm talking about the anxiety that doesn't have to be there. Americans are suffering from unneeded and... and um, unjustified anxiety in our life. We bring it upon ourselves and we don't have to. I have anxiety. All right, why do you have anxiety? Let's, let's get to the root of it. Why do you have anxiety? Uh, because whatever the reason is, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to throw anybody's anxiety pills away. Please understand that. But if you have anxiety and it's curable from biblical principle, why would you not do that? I'll tell you the reason why, because we like playing the victim. We like to have a crutch. I have anxiety. I absolutely have anxiety, but I, I work through it. 
And then when I have anxiety and I go, well, wait a second, for the God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right, can I, God, is this something that I can work through spiritually or do I need to, ha- or do I need to go see a doctor? Do I need to see a doctor about this? Some people have, uh, you know, they, they lose control. They don't really know how to manage it. They, they, uh, you will find control when you give him control. He'll show you the right doctor if you need a doctor. You know, not everybody that has anxiety needs to go up to the pastor's office and have oil poured on their head and have an exorcism. And, and you know, the pastor is not the great physician. He is. But he can also point you in the right directions. I know of some pastors who they, you know, they wouldn't. Uh, if, if you're a church, if you if, if you're a member in their church, and they found out that you were taking medication, they would just rip you to shreds. All right. Well, there's this thing called grace, pastor. Space for grace. Um, Miss Kathy, she can't take a pain pill to save her life without getting no, in, incredibly nauseous and sick. And we've, we've had conversations about medication. What can you do to help it? What can you do to, and she said, I just look at a picture of my brother Will and I feel all better. That's what she said. She said, his name is Dr. Pohazi. So she said, I look at my brother, my Dr. Pohazi brother, and I feel all better. Uh, you thought I was going to say she got sick. No, sometimes I can be nice. Um, uh, but uh, she, she, it, sin steals calmness. Calmness, calmness. You see, when when the when the when the ang- could you imagine being a disciple out on the out on that boat and you thought you were going to capsize and go in and Peter's like, guys, I can't swim, <laughs> you know. And everybody's, you know, you man, you're the heaviest guy. I can't drag you to shore. Andrew says, you know, and they're out on the waters and oh no, and you're out in life and the the anxiety of life is crashing around you. Jesus can still steal still the waters. But sin pushes anxiety on you. God gives calmness. The Bible says in Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Now you say, oh, Brother Jake, you're saying that I don't have peace because I'm wicked? Brother Jake, I was here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and I I got in late on Wednesday, but I was here. Brother Jake, I put my tithe in. I handed out some gospel tracts. I love my wife, or I love my husband, or I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to live right. I'm not wicked. No, no, no. But how near are you to wickedness? You may not be wicked, but how much wickedness have you taken in at work? How much wickedness that came in on that television set? How much wickedness came in on those headphones? How much wickedness passed through this mind of ours? How much wickedness is stirred up in our heart? And I said it last Sunday morning. Sometimes we need to get into our confession time with the Lord and not just confess the surface sins, but say, God, stir up the sediment at the bottom of my heart. Sins in there that I don't even know are there. Oh, God, cleanse me of secret faults. Oh, God, clean me up. I regard not iniquity in my heart. God, I, I, I don't mean to. When I, when I break your speed limit, Lord, I don't mean to. I, I just, I lo- sometimes I lose track. You know, I got to tell you, sometimes I, 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 I say speed, but my truck only goes 75. It tops out at 75. And most places I go, are 70 to 75 miles an hour. So I don't really speed. But um, um, Indiana, you get into Indiana and it drops down to 65. Bunch of stinking slow pokes. Uh, but it goes down to 65, you know. And um, I was passing these guys. Ooh, you know, I was passing these guys. I was empty. So um, um, a lightweight 70 miles an hour is faster than a weighted down 70 miles an hour. And I'm passing these guys just by a hair. And I'm passing these guys. And... Um, I had to speed up, you know, I don't want to stay in the hammer lane. The left lane is called the hammer lane. And I was in the hammer lane, right lane is the cruise lane. And I'm in the, the hammer lane to pass this guy, and I passed him at 72 miles an hour, and I forgot to drop my speed down. And here I am going, zoom, why, why is everybody going so slow? Here I am, zoom, 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 passing all these guys, you know, getting over, and getting up and getting over and getting back over and playing this, this leapfrog game. And then I looked down at my speedometer and I saw I was doing 72, 73 miles an hour. I'm like, oh no, and I bumped it down. I had forgot 
I was on autopilot, you know, I was just kind of enjoying the sunshine and cruising along and this is nice, you know, and nope, I forgot how fast I was going. You know, sometimes you lose track in life. Sometimes I, I saw a video of a pastor, he was getting up and he was ripping. He said, some of you need to basically clean up your life and get the blank out of your life and he said a cuss word. And he was, ah, and he was preaching. And he was cut from a, a, a bad, you know, his testimony, and he came to Christ and everything. And he, ah, he, ah, and he said a bad word, and he's like, "Oops," you know. Sometimes we have oopses. Now I hope to never have that kind of oops from the pulpit, you know. Um, but uh, uh, you know, sometimes we have oops in life. Oh God, I don't know what I was doing. I didn't, Lord, I didn't mean to. I forgot. Would you forgive me of that? Yes, the Lord's going to forgive you of that. But the devil will always come along and make you fear and make you think God's not listening and make you think God doesn't hear your first John 1, 9 and God doesn't, he's not listening to you or you're backlogged somewhere. Sorry, your prayers, sorry, your prayers haven't, aren't getting answered because what you want's on back order in heaven. That's not the way it works. And what happens is, is when we don't think that God is hearing, the devil is consistently talking. The world is consistently talking. Our flesh is consistently talking. And we're near wickedness. That's why three to thrive. Every service matters. If you can be in church, be in church. Every chance you get, be in church. Because you're out there in secular society, as I preach today, sanctify the secular. You can't just go out there and live void of the Bible and void of prayer and void of worship with and praise and prayer and confession with the Lord. You can't just go out there and wing it and expect to thrive. You've got to be near that book and near prayer and near worship and near confession and near and everything you do every day and every deed you do out there, sanctify it. If you can't sanctify it, it's probably carnal and sinful and shouldn't be done. Sanctify the secular. Take your, bring your worship with you and take your worship when you leave. Go with worship. But the devil will steal, the sin will steal your calmness. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked, making you anxious over things the devil does or sin does, making you uh, angry, angry very quickly. Angry very quickly. He steals your calmness. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Isaiah 26, 3. Great peace have they which love thy law. Great peace, great calmness have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Number one, sin steals your, your, uh, uh, your conscience. Your conscience. Number two, it steals your calmness. Number three, sin steals your countenance. Man, there's um, some people I've seen over the years and especially as, as I was a teenager and uh, grew up in church and uh, junior, you know, elementary and junior high and high school and adulthood. And um, I see people out and about. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't, I didn't find the fountain of youth. I'm 35. I look just about 35. Um, uh, I hope I do anyway. Uh, you know, <laughs> I hope I'm not looking, you know, 15 years older than I feel or than I look uh, or than I am. But I, I, I'd see people and and I'm telling you, late nights and partying hard and drinking and hard drugs will age you before you know it and will steal your, your countenance. Sin will arch your back and stoop your shoulders. Sin will rob you of your health and steal your countenance. And by the way, um, uh, I see some of our senior saints walking around here. You're walking a little slower than you used to be. But if you're going to wear out your knees and your hips and your shoulders and your elbows, if you're going to wear out your voice, do it for the Lord. Your body's wearing down anyway. Don't advance it by living in sin. Put it to good use by living for the Lord. You're losing your body faculties anyway. Don't advance it. Don't advance it. Somebody's like, the ship's going down. Cool, put more holes in it. No, I don't want to sink faster. I need to get the life raft out. Life raft out. I need to make sure everybody's collected. We need time to get on that life raft, right? Hey, the boat's sinking anyway. Let's collect what we can. Let's get what we can out of it. Now, the, the sin will steal your countenance. Now, the first occurrence of countenance in Scripture is Genesis chapter 4, verse number 5. It says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. What does that mean? Happy and then. You ever see somebody and you're like, 
I want to ask them how their day is, but just by the look on their face, I already know. <laughs> you see somebody and you're just like, nope, not talking to them today. You know, I've seen, I, I know my dad well enough and my mom and some of my family members well enough to look at them and go, yep, they're on one of their little tangents today. I think I'm just going to steer clear. <laughs> Um, and, and what, why, how can you tell that their countenance? My dad told me, he said, Jake, when you become a dad, you'll be able to see the, 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 the changes in your kid's face to know what's going on in their head. Now, all the time I can see it, Lucas, you know, he's whatever's going on or his mom's on his case or whatever. And, and I can see, and his face changes. I didn't do anything wrong. And he does one of these numbers, you know, put his tongue down here, curl his lip snarl. Yeah, your countenance fell. Sin will steal your good countenance. Sin will come along and steal your smile. Sin will come along and steal your joy. You know, you watch and see. You watch over the years as people come into church and they're consistent and they're happy and they're upbeat and things like that. And then over time, and life has a way of doing it, of beating us down and getting us tired. And I'm not talking about the ebb and flow and the ups and downs, but I'm talking about a, a consistent decline over time where you see somebody's countenance fall and fall and fall and fall. It's not because of sin only. It's because we haven't, we haven't gotten our big brother to help us. You see, sin is the big bully, is the, is the thief on the block taking everybody's lunch money. We just need our big brother to come help. You see, a nearness to your big brother and a nearness to your father helps with the bully on the block. You can't avoid him. You gotta walk down that block every single day. And sin wants to come along and steal your conscience. It wants to steal your calmness and it wants to steal your countenance. Isaiah 3, 9. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Why? Because their counseling, your countenance tells on you. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. A good countenance. A good countenance. When this devil steals that, he gives you an overly sad countenance. He gives you an overly stern countenance. Or an overly scared countenance. So, um, lines in the head are off, you know, overly lined heads and wrinkles in the head. Jamie's telling me all the time, you know, stop doing that. Wear your sunglasses, you know, do this. Don't look at the sun. I'm like, yeah, I walk around just going, look at the sun today. That's burning my eyes, but I'm going to, no, I don't wear your sunglasses, put on, you know, sunscreen, you know, wrinkles. I bought this cream, put it on your face. No, no, I want to be wrinkled. Okay. It's what I, I want to be a wrinkly old man. Um, so just leave me alone and let me age with disgrace, okay? So uh, uh, heavenly li heavily <laughs> heavily lined head uh, 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 or, or ahead of time is um, don't uh, what I said earlier about don't age yourself before you need to. Don't age yourself before you need to. Um, many times the the the, the countenance. It's aged by, I mean, there's so many things in diet and health, by hard work, by sickness, by anxiety, by sleepless nights. Sin steals our countenance. Sin will come in, swoop in, rob us of these things. And number four, it's going to rob you of your character. Good character, your testimony. They say, uh, oh, how's it said? Reputation is what people think you are. Character is what you are. Reputation is what people think you are. Character is what you are. Uh, there's another one. Sow a thought, reap a word. Sow a word, reap a deed. Sow a deed, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a life. Your character starts with a thought, with a word, with a deed, with a habit, with a character, with a life. Um, so what is the manner of our life? What is the uh, testimony of our life? How do people think about us? Now, you can't control all of that. 
You can live for the Lord and people can still think rotten of you. They're wrong, but you can't control what people think. You can control, though, how he thinks. You say, I can control how God thinks? Well, in a way, if you obey the word of God, I promise you his thoughts toward you are going to be a lot more friendly, a lot more kind, a lot more merciful and long-suffering and patient. God is willing to, hey, you are permitting God to bless you. But when sin comes along and it steals these things from us, sin will come and steal your good character. They say it takes a lifetime, a lifetime to build your character. It takes one decision to lose it. A lifetime, building character, build, 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 and then, uh, and then one bad decision to lose it. One to lose it. 2 Timothy 3.10 says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. He's saying to Timothy, Paul's saying to Timothy, you know who I am. You know my character. You know what I'm all about. And when we lose our good character, we get bad character. And what happens is it corrupts our heart inside, and then it corrupts our habits outside. A corrupted heart will lead to corrupted deeds. A corrupted heart will lead to corrupted deeds. If you let the devil steal your character, if you give in to sin, we used to sing that. I think it might be a Psalms. Um, uh, uh, I, I could be wrong. If sinners entice you, just say no. Or the devil entices you, just say no. I can't even remember it. What is it? Yeah, if sinners entice you, right? If sinners entice you, just say no, say no. And the kids say no, say no, no. Uh, uh, if sinners entice you, um, uh, if, if they get you to sin, if they get you to, uh, or I can't remember all of it, but, but uh, basically, if sinners entice thee, the Bible says, consent thou not. Here's another one. Consent thou not. No. Consent thou not. Oh, no. Yeah, don't, don't do it. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And it just goes on and on and on and on. Kind of like, this is the song that doesn't end, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, it corrupts your heart inside, and then it corrupts your habits outside. Just as Jesus cleans up the inside, and if we allow him and we live cleanly and obey the Bible, the outside gets cleaned up. I'm telling you, a seed planted by the devil on the inside, it's only a matter of time before the fruits of that come on the outside. It's only a matter of time. So he'll steal your good character. And lastly, lastly, he'll steal your, well, yeah, he'll, sin, he'll steal your, your communion, your communion with God, your fellowship with God, is our, or yeah, your fellowship with God. Isaiah 59, uh, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities, your lawlessness, your, your disregard for obedience for Scripture have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Why isn't God hearing me? Do, this, do it self-checkup. Have you confessed your iniquities? Have you begged God for forgiveness? Have you said, dear God in heaven, have you condemned your sin as much as God condemns sin? Have you said, I know it's wrong without a shadow of a doubt, and God, I'm fighting, and I'm, hard, I'm having a hard time, and dear God, I'm difficult, and it's a stronghold in my life, and oh God, I need you. Oh God, I need you. God says he does not despise, and he will not turn away a broken heart and a contrite spirit. But we have got to, we've got to agree on God, on our sin condition. Sin comes and it will steal these things. It'll steal these things from us. Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? You will become um, uh, ignorant of God's affection uh, uh, if you allow sin to steal your communion with him. Now, God still loves you, but you're not going to feel loved. God still loves you, but you will not feel loved. And then you'll be ignorant of God's actions. You'll say, I don't even see God's blessings in my life anymore. Yeah, it's because the devil's pull, or sin has pulled the wool over your eyes and you can't see him daily loading you up with benefits. 
So when we lose our communion with God, we are, become ignorant of his affection and ignorant of his actions. You don't see God working behind the scenes anymore. You don't see something bad happening and going, God was in that. God did something for me. God is moving the pieces on the chessboard. God is moving things and arranging things in my life because I know he's in control. When sin has stolen your communion with him, you don't see it that way anymore. You see God as a big guy with, or a big bully or a big kid with a magnifying glass and we're all the ants. You see God as, a, as the bully on the block. When it's sin that's been the bully on the block the whole time, stealing from you, stealing from you, stealing from you, stealing from you. And the last thing that's stolen from us is a crown of glory. Now you may get a crown of life, but that good crown, Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So I'm looking around going, I'm not gonna let Pip take my crown. I'm not gonna let Jim take my crown. I'm not gonna let uh, Miss Jennifer take my crown, or Bill, or, or Dr. Pohazi, or, or, or uh, 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 Dan, or, or Alex. You know, I'm gonna let no man take my crown. Last time I checked, I'm a man too. And we often throw things away. No, no man take it. I always look inward too and say, I, so I'm mostly in my, my biggest enemy. You know, sometimes we just forfeit it. We take it ourselves. We, we take it ourselves. We take it instead of letting God give it. Take heed and hold fast that no man take thy crown. Salvation is a gift. We know at Romans 6, 23, that no man can take from you. Crowns, on the other hand, have to do with rewards. Rewards. The Bible says in um, uh, 2 John 1 8, look to yourselves that we lose not the things which we have wrought or brought about, uh, 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 but that we receive a full reward. I want rewarded in heaven. Listen, I, I want to live for Jesus simply because he saved me. He died on the cross. He died. He was tortured and beat for me, hung on a tree for me embarrassed and ashamed and buffeted and spat upon and his beard ripped out of his face and hit in his private parts by Roman soldiers for me. And then they finished him off with a spear in his side for me. That's enough to live for him. But he said, I've got stuff for you. I have rewards for you. I, I, well, I, okay, I want to live for the Lord. If I'm going to live for the Lord, if I'm going to live for the Lord, He's not only just going to save me from eternal damnation and give me a new a, a new body and, and 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 make me new one day and sinless, but He's going to reward me. There's an inheritance in heaven with Jesus. That uh, what an incredible thought that is. Okay, well then I want a piece of that. I want a piece of that. I don't want a number one. I don't want to forfeit it. I don't want to forfeit it. I don't want to be a sellout today for what the, the future holds in heaven. I don't want to sell my future on the altar of the immediate. And then number two, I don't want to let, I don't want, I don't want to let sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil or sin to come in and steal it from me. So I've got to keep it in the safe. I've got to keep it safe. How do I keep my rewards reserved and safe? By staying near the one who gives them. By staying near to the one who gives them to me. I want to stay near Jesus. Because number one, I'm a whole lot closer to getting that reward. And number two, the devil, don't, the devil he doesn't come hunting around where Jesus is. The devil does not come poking and prodding around where Jesus is. I want to hide behind the, 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 the uh, coattails of Jesus and go, na 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 boo boo. <laughs> I'm close to Jesus. Temptation's always out there. Tribulation's always out there. Trials are always out there. They're going to be out there. They're going to abound. But I want, I want to be near Jesus the whole time. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Most people, they go, you got to go through the valley of the shadow of death whether you like it or not. You might as well go with Jesus. You might as well go with him. But most people don't. They go through the valley of the shadow of death and they're way out. They're leagues in front of Jesus, you know. Oh, I wish I was going through with Jesus. He's been there the whole time. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But you're not using me. You're not, you're not taking advantage of me as your Savior and your Lord and uh, uh, using me. I've given you every, all the ammunition you need to fight the enemy. 
I've given you everything you need. And sin comes along and it steals from us. You know what would happen if somebody came along and tried to pickpocket me and I knew they were trying to do it? If somebody came and said, hey, watch out, there's a pickpocket in the crowd. You know what I do when I go to events? I take my wallet. Where's my wallet? Oh, it's downstairs. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, my wallet's gone. Um, okay, let's say, uh, where's my phone? Ah, uh, here we go. Here, here's my phone. And it's, it's some, there's pickpockets, and they're stealing phones and things in your pockets. And they, I, take, I take my, I put it in my front pocket. I put it in my front pocket, or I'll put it inside my jacket pocket. And as soon as some, you're not bumping into me. I don't let people bump into me. This isn't, you know, 1850s England where there's pit pockets everywhere, you know, taking stuff out of everybody's pockets. But what do I do? Hey, there's people around here stealing. What am I going to do? I'm going to be on the lookout. And then I'm going to take precautions. Go, yeah, I'm not letting you steal from me. The Bible is telling us there's a thief Sin is a thief, and it's stealing from believers. What's it stealing? It's stealing your crown, which is a reward. It's stealing your, um, uh, your communion. It's stealing your character. It's stealing your countenance. It's, it's, it's stealing your conscience. Man, it's, it's coming along and it's stealing everything. Ransacking the Christian. It's stealing your conscience. It's taking everything from you. It wants to leave you destitute like um, uh, uh, the Good Samaritan story where the guy's laying in the ditch. That's what sin wants to do to you. It wants to leave you bloodied in a ditch. You see, it'll never, it, it, sin will never say, um, hey, come along. I'm going to leave you bloodied in a ditch. It says, come along. We're going to have a good time. I'm going to get you so drunk that you don't remember anything. I'm going to get you so high and so stoned out of your mind. I'm going to get, uh, the, I got these experimental drugs. You ought to try these. It'll give you the greatest trip or the greatest high of your life. It never comes along and says, here, these will fry your brain. Or here, this is going to kill your liver. Or here, this is going to, um, uh, you know, take your, this is going to send your wife and kids packing because it turns you into a monster. Sin never comes along and says that. It says, look at me. Look at me. Look at her. I can give you what she can't give you. I can give you what he can't give you. I can give you the fun that you've never experienced. Come and let your wild side out. You know, um, they call Las Vegas Sin City. Sin City. What happened, and this is their slogan, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You see, sin has something similar. It'll say that, but it's lying to you. Hey, man, what happens here stays here. God said, be sure your sin will find you out. It doesn't mean it'll put, your name, it'll put your name up on a billboard and make fun of you. It means that you cannot sin and get away with it. You cannot live in sin and get away with it because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And everybody thinks, oh, if I do something bad, I'm going to get killed in a car accident. That doesn't mean that. Only. It means sin, when it's done with you, steals you of a good conscience, steals you of good cheer, steals you of communion, steals you of your countenance, steals from you your crown, steals from you. It steals from you. Sin will steal from you. It'll steal from you. And if you give in to sin tonight, if you're living in sin tonight, get out of it. Start making the trek back to the Lord tonight. And that really just starts with finding God, getting alone with God somewhere, getting on your knees somewhere, getting alone with the Lord somewhere. I don't care where it is and saying, dear God, I've been living in sin. I've been living near sin. I've been, I've been adjacent to it. And it's always a journey, folks. Lot had to journey to Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't just appear there. He set his sights toward it. And the closer we get to the things of the world and the things of iniquity being comfortable with us, the sooner we are committing them. And, and I mean actionably. We've already done it in our thoughts. We've already done it here. Sin's going to steal from you. Don't let it tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for the warnings of the Bible. Uh, sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. But we can have a new life in Christ. Lord, if any of us are on the verge of death tonight, help us to get away from it. Help us to back away from that cliff tonight. Get away from that edge and come back to Jesus. 
If anybody in here is a lost sheep tonight or a prodigal son tonight, Lord, I ask that they'd get it right. Get right tonight, Heavenly Father. Our Lord, thank you again for the warnings and the admonitions of the Bible to teach us and say, why aren't we getting our prayers answered? And why isn't God raining down blessings uh, from heaven on us? And why do I not feel like my prayers are, are even reaching the skies or reaching the throne of heaven anymore? Why do I feel this way? The Bible clearly states it out, writes it out for us that our iniquities, our iniquities are stopping the flow. Our sins are hindering us. Heavenly Father, and it starts to it just starts with confession. Confess and then forsake. Heavenly Father, help us to be willing and smart enough, smart enough to know to confess our sins. Lord, I'd ask that you would bless us about our week. As we go to and fro, the Bible says you know our uprising and our downsitting. When we go out and when we come in, uh, when we uh, uh, arise in the morning and lay down at night, Heavenly Father, you know everything that we take in, everything that we think. Lord, I'd ask that you'd guide our steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And um, Lord, there's so many things about that in the Bible. And Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us. Uh, God, give us guidance. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.